we have the 15 degree pen angle, and we may find some difficulty shifting from a 45 degree pen angle down to a 15 degree pen angle. But it's much less complex than punching the key on the typewriter to change from cap to lower case. You just move your thumb and forefinger and you've made the shift. Well, let's see a way to find what a 15 degree pen angle would be. You draw a square, and sure that it's a square. And we draw a diagonal on that square, and that diagonal, of course, cuts a 90 degree angle, so this is 45 degrees. Well, three times 15 is 45, so we'll find a, a, a third, a mark a third of the way down, and this should be approximately a 15 degree pen angle. So get the edge of the pen flat like that, and it will make a much stronger letter. <coughs> the letters are only uh, seven and a half pen widths in height, which means the top of the letter comes halfway between the waistline and the ascender line. So start about oh, 10 minutes to 11, imagine it's a clock now. Swing down around to about quarter after five, the sloping wide letter. The C is something like the O, except that the upper arm is lifted. Don't make it rigidly straight. Lower the bottom arm. And notice that if you join the ends of the arms, that should be about a five degree slope from the vertical, so that if you were writing an L after it, the L would be in parallel to that dotted line. D is our next letter, so with a flat pen angle, we get a heavy vertical stem and a relatively light horizontal, lighter than the vertical stem. Make two parallel lines to see, and then swing out and get a full round. So C, D, G is the next one. G originally was C. Then the Romans threw K out and the C for the K sound, and then we invented a new sign for G. See, my hand just, without my wanting to, automatically put a seraph at the head there. Then the Romans added a vertical stroke here in the lower right hand corner with a seraph on it and made that wide G. The Q is like an O with that diagonal tail on it. The diagonal part is really the Q, as the British call a line of people. This is the Q down <laughs> that line. And be sure that it's not, that it doesn't hang down in a spiritless way, or that it doesn't crowd up so that it's going to bump into a minuscule U or a majuscule U, which always comes after the Q. You must have uncut paper in here. O, C, D, G, Q are that first width group, the wide group. The next group is the four-fifths group. That is the width is four-fifths the height. And that's a little difficult to memorize, but with practice you'll get it. So pull that down, lay the crossbar on the midline, just above it, and then draw the other one. Without flourishes, it's a rather dull letter but we'll get into some flourishes later on. The A, you can start with H because H gives you a measure for the A, the base of A. Now overlap those two strokes. Don't come down like that and then add that on top. So it should overlap the beginning stroke. This crossbar is the width of the bar below the center. The center would be halfway between the base, the writing line, and the cap line. So this is just on just the width of the bar below the center. This rests on the mid line, dividing instead of between the writing line, cap line. And we try to keep to the 15 degree pen angle here. Again, overlap the strokes, almost a slight reverse curve. And come down. Now, how do you hit this down here? 
Look at your eyes down there, and out of the corner of your eye, watch the pen, and you can keep your appointment in that lower right-hand corner. But again, you must overlap. The T start with the horizontal. We always write from left to right and from top to bottom. And then if you accept the most rapid cursive, you'll find the midpoint and come down. The Romans didn't show us how to write U because they didn't have they didn't have the letter. The V served that purpose. And this calligraphic version you find is the most stable. If this curves all the way up here without that, it's likely to look uh, insecure. Now, how do you get V, X, Y, W to slope? Easy. If you remember this, come down quite steeply for the first stroke of V. Then go way over on the second stroke. You want to know what the slope is? Find the midpoint and connect it with the point of the count. Now there's your letter slope. X, start the way you did V, down steep. Go way over and then cross above center so that the letter is not top heavy. This is a little bit above center. Y is something like the top part of X, except that you come down a little lower, below center. Fix the vertical and go way over. Draw that in. A letter, which, a letter form which you may find more satisfactory is easier than that. You don't have that vertical. Now, Z can be ide the idea of Z in the sense of the horizontal, a diagonal, and the horizontal. And the slope of it you find by imagining the line connecting those two arms. But that looks terribly self-righteous. It looks mean. It bears its teeth. So sweeten it up a little bit with the slightest reverse curve. Whatever you do, don't overdo that. Then go over the diagonal, and then the slight reverse curve on the bottom arm. Now you see it looks much more, much warmer, much more human. The last letter in this series really we're not sure that it belongs in this series, K. Again, the Romans threw K out of the alphabet back when they invented G. And we don't see K except when they transliterate Greek words, and then it's a kappa, which is a slightly different design from the one we use. It, you'll, you'll have to experiment to find out how far to go over. Bring this diagonal down just about center. And then, if you read in Edward Johnson, the secret of K is to make a 90 degree angle in here. And if you got a 90 degree angle there, you'll see it. 90. Start with 45 down. But that 90 degree angle will give you a good K. This lower counter must be bigger than the upper counter. <coughs> now, the next group should be quite easy, but the beginner gets careless, and don't you? You start with a D, half as wide as it is high. Slope downhill just slightly, horizontal. The horizontal up here, but shoulder it up a bit with a curve. Come in and put the crossbar just above center as we did with H. Now, the lower counter, you see, is larger than the upper counter, and there's no danger of the letter being top heavy. D, we begin E as we began D with an L stroke and keep it very narrow. This is short. E is a narrow letter. Now rest the second arm, the mid arm, on the line that's halfway between the routing line and the ascender line. Ignore the waistline, by the way. It's just, you can see the waistline in your guidelines. Ignore it. Pretend it's not there. Because that has nothing to do with the construction of the just move. The F is just something like the E, but the mid bar, the second bar, is just under the midline because of this counter down here. The top would look squeezed if uh, you made it narrow. If you made, made the second bar on the line, midline. Now J, 
in the late letter, it's I to the descendant. And until about 1527, always J could be vowel or consonant, I could be vowel or consonant. Uh, in our usage of it, it's a consonant only. But being an I with a descender, I like to have the J come down a little below the writing line. It's in here, you see. L. We've been practicing L with D and E. D. Yellow bears. Short R vowel. The T. Start speaking like a D. Right shoulder, horizontal. Swing out a nice full bowl. Come down below the midline. Or that horizontal. R. Very much like a T. And the classic letter. The bowl pulls down to a horizontal below the center. And then where the horizontal here meets that curve, it's the diagonal. Now, uh, you'll find in, in some advertising letters, under the influence of German, I think, primarily, that the diagonal of K will touch the vertical stem, and, and the R begins to resemble K, the curved top. Well, R and K have nothing in common, I'd say. And get that horizontal in there. S is our next letter. We worked with S last time. Remember, you lift the upper bar, get a full curve, straighten, uh, straighten the spine, you get a full, larger full curve, slightly larger, and then lower the bottom arm. So the idea is to lift the top arm, get a full curve, straighten the um, spine, get a larger, slightly larger full curve, and lower the bottom arm. Now you may think they, this doesn't look larger than that. Let's turn it over and see if it is. Now if you look at that, you see the bottom is, what was the bottom, is much larger here than the top. Can you find that? Uh, see, this looks small, but our eyes magnified this. But you turn, the, you turn an S over and you can always tell whether it's top heavy or not. That finishes the, the section this group. <coughs> and then comes the wide letters, the two wide letters. In a sense, M is a letter, W is two letters, as the name suggests. Now, how do you make M slope? It's already all the strokes slope, so you have to slope the sloping letter. Don't slope this first stroke of M over very far. Come down very close to it with this second overlapping stroke. The classic M doesn't quite come down to the riding line. Now, M is wide, but it's wide because of this central V, not because of space here or space in here. What gives it its great width is the width of that central V. So as with, as with riding V, come down steep, go way over, and slope right, we'll find the midpoint, and there's our letter slope. Now focus your eyes here on the left counter. Don't watch the pen. It cuts out of the corner of your eye. These counters must be approximately the same size. So by focusing your eye here, you can get this out of the corner of your eye to equal that. Let me do an M again. That's a little narrow to my taste. I think that's a handsomer M. It's a gracious and wonderful letter. Men in Hebrew was water, and they had a, a great body of water in the original sign. That's the origin of M, much water. W made up of two Vs. The V was still called U in Queen Elizabeth's day. It was a version of the vowel, so we come down steep and go way over. But it's not as wide as V, or W would be way too wide. Now, make the third stroke parallel to the first one, the fourth stroke parallel to the second one. W is not an upside down M. One and three are not parallel on M. Two, two and four are not parallel on M. But one 
and three are parallel on W, three and four, of course, are parallel on W because we're repeating the single letter. And I'd like to say last time that ampersand is baby talk for and, and, perfe, and. And this is the sign that they read as and. The sign in the castle printing type, which is on the horn book the little children used in New England before the Revolution. And uh, that was ampersand. Baby talk for and, perfe, and. Another version has the Greek epsilon form of E, and it's more recognizably the Latin E-T in the end. But the most beautiful answer sound is one, I think, which you can write very quickly without even lifting the pen if you practice it. That's an E-T. The one I like for rapid, fast riding is this. That's an E-T. <coughs> now, how do you learn to make strokes that are round, that have full smooth curves and straight vertical, straight horizontals? Well, you take practice and you don't worry about it. You just keep at it and finally they'll be. The curves will be full and sweet, and the straights will be straight. Don't worry. Keep working. Ohio is a word that I recommend you practice frequently. Have pads all over the house. Wherever you like to sit down and have a cup of coffee or tea or watch television, have a pad there, and with the pen in your hand and the pad in your lap, you'll be amazed how much practice you can get in, no matter how exciting the program is you're listening to. You can follow the program all right and still do practice work. You just watch the pen and you listen. <laughs> listen to the program. It may be the funny way to avoid concentrating, but um, I find that it works and people uh, get ahead with their talent by practicing doing questions with the whole family watching television. Well, Ohio is an awfully good word to practice uh, to get round, round, and straight. Great. So let's try Ohio. Wonderful thing about television is you can't find in a book is that you can watch the action. The action is so necessary. The teacher is ideal, but there may be no teacher near you. And it's let television be your teacher. Well, you can watch the action, the movement, the touch and movement of the pen, because that's something no book can ever show you. You can tell about it, but not enough. Let's try it again. After a while, your rows will be round and your horizontals and verticals will be straight. Amazing. You have to keep doing it. And Ohio is a sweet word. Another word that I suggest that you practice is Portland. You go around town here, and it's amazing how often on buildings and windows of offices and stores and trucks. You see the word Portland, and it falls into two parts, Porta and. There's such a hole between the L and the A that uh, you read and very often, uh, and that's the other Portland. Well, it's unpleasant you know, to have a construction fall apart that way. Now, <coughs> uh, so it's a good thing to practice. If you learn a lot about spacing, writing this name in Portland, try it out. You have such a big hole. Coming after that L, uh, with the A falling away, so we need to space these out. So let's see how wide we can get our spacing. See, the O is quite some distance from the P to get a really beautiful effect. 
I'll try to get that distance optically the same. The spacing is more important than the layers. You won't realize that for a while, probably. T is tricky because of the counters, the holes underneath the that horizontal top piece. Now this L comes rather close to that. Oh, and keep that short. And A comes clear down right to the end of that horizontal arm. Now the width of the bar below center come down. A is the opposite of V. It's way over and down steep. Where before, it was V, it was down steep and then way over. Now M is some distance away. Some distance away from A. And the diagonal with almost a slight reverse curve. And it focus your eye on the first stroke of down stroke of M, and out of the corner of your eye, guide the pen, and you'll find you can make these quite parallel. Now, obviously, D is going to have to be way over here. Way over. Remember the rule about parallels being farther apart from the parallel and the curve? And then two curves are closer together. Now, you don't see such a great hole in here. Uh, the two are seem to be spaced better. Let's try it again and watch the movement of the pen. We don't use this plain alphabet very much in writing, except for children maybe, or when you're working very fast, almost scribbling. We want to get a more finished looking letter than this plain one. But in order to do, to write slurry cats, slab serif cats, and in order to do full serious formal Roman cats, you have to base them on these plain cats. The purpose for working repeatedly with the plain cats is that you memorize the rib group. And no matter how well you do a capital letter, if it's in the wrong rib group, it's going to fall apart. It's going to be ugly. So memorize the rib group. That's the most important thing at the beginning. A flat pen angle in the rib group. Then you need to know the construction. So let's try Portland again. See, my hand wants to put serifs on automatically. Oh, spacing is so important. Because as I said, a letter is more paper than it is than it is ink. So you have to watch. Ah, that's a nice R. Ah. Horizontals have to be wider than the verticals. L is difficult. A tucks right next to it. The L has a counter here, and A falls away to the right. Making problems. Way over. Later, we'll change the pen angle for the verticals on end so that it's not such a monotonous looking letter. And D, of course, has to be way over because of those parallels. D is such a nice letter. The vertical here, short horizontal. They're straight, and then that sweeping full curve, a wonderful sweeping full curve. All right, now, I said that the important thing is to keep the proper sequence and direction of stroke, order and direction of stroke. It's interesting that in Hebrew, and in Arabic, and Chinese, as well as in our Roman alphabet, there are very definite ways of writing. That is, you work according to prescribed sequences and directions of stroke. And if you change it, you're bound to get in, likely to get into trouble. But I know the Chinese teachers are extremely firm in the same way in Korea and Japan of getting a proper order and direction of stroke for those brush characters. Now, in cursive work, as in uh, cursive Hebrew and cursive Arabic, of course, they push stroke, as we do some in italic. But for anything, even formal or semi-formal, keep to the traditional 
for the direction of stroke. Now let's look at an A. And this is one. And we know the entry is loaded this way, and I'll show you why we know it. Two. Not, you don't add that afterwards. Three. How do we know that that was the second stroke? Well, another alphabet, a quick alphabet, was rusted. And the crossbar was omitted. But in Uncle, the crossbar was added. It was put back in the letter. But notice, it follows the first, this is the right side of A, this is the crossbar, and here comes the left side of A. Now, the hand rounded this in Carolyn C. But this is the left side of A, this is the crossbar. This is the right side, so that later, we're skipping the black letter by the Renaissance. Here's the left side of A, here is the crossbar, here's the right side. Mm -hmm.